GCHQ Cheltenham. Well, chosen to join us here in the Palace Hotel Ballroom at this time. We certainly hope you all enjoy the show. And remember, people, that no matter who you are and what you do to live, thrive, and survive, there's still some things that make us all the same. You, me, them, everybody. Everybody. Very good evening and welcome to tonight's end game. It's Monday the 31st of March 2014. And we definitely do want to welcome the men and women of GCHQ who have chosen to interfere with Neil. Well, come on guys, come and interfere with me because I say to you, bead window, bead window, bead window. You know what that means. The end of the line. I know your game all too well. Dave Mustaine bringing truth through the power of rock. As he does all over the world. Thank you very much, Dave, and the guys from Megadeth. Right, uh, let's get straight into it then, because they appear to have been interfering with Neil, and they have yet to track me down. So, uh, we are going to go straight to the root of the cause, and uh, the root of that cause is not brown root and... Uh, um, whatever Brahma stands for. No, it's Circo. Now, I decided that whilst uh, Neil was having loads of issues, I would go off and have a squirrel around at uh, who and what Circo is, or what they think they are, or what we think they, they are. And, you know... I've just been looking at their website and they are bringing service to life in immigration management. They are bringing service to life in transport. They are bringing service to life in offender management. And they are bringing service to life in UK defence. And they are bringing service to life in local government. So, they have their sticky little thing. Oh, and US Defense as well. Uh, and Metro services in Dubai. So, they are truly global. They have their fingers in every single element of your life. You cannot escape this company. This massive, massive multinational company. So, let's see what their official blurb is. Let's see what the official story is behind Serco. And then we'll go on to have a look at some of the truth of their history. So, Serco makes a difference in the lives of millions of people around the world. They don't say whether it's a good or bad difference, though, do they? And I suppose it depends on your perspective. Uh, their customers are national and local governments and leading companies with more than 50 years' experience of helping them to achieve their goals. Mm. They've actually been around a little bit longer than that. Uh, by focusing on the needs of the people they serve, uh, they are enable they enable their customers to deliver better outcomes. Uh, their frontline delivery involves them in vital areas of public life, including safe transport, finding sustainable jobs for the long-term unemployed. There's that key word again sustainable. Neil was using it all the way through the past two hours um, and I've got to say um, when 
those guests come on and they get the full time, as I'm sure will be coming up at some point in the future, they have got amazing, amazing information, which no doubt is why they had issues. Let me just check and make sure they're not interfering with me at all, because I have a little uh, notification. Uh, no, no, we're all good. Excellent. Right. Uh, so, they also manage crucial businesses, uh, business processes for both public and private sector organisations. Uh, they help patients recover more quickly. They're improving the local environment, rehabilitating offenders, protecting borders and supporting the armed forces. Oh, you would not believe just how deep this company goes down the rabbit hole. They go all the way to the bottom, into the main chamber and beyond. The long-term drivers of their markets include public service reform. I wonder if they're going at this with a common purpose. They're developing economies, investment in services and infrastructure. <laughs> the developing economies, then. Goodness me. <laughs> no wonder we're in the toilet. They want a partner who gives them confidence through constant delivery. Yeah, of what? Uh, probably stuff that comes out the back end of a cow. Uh, who can an anticipate and adapt to change and who can understand what they want to achieve across their organisation. They value our refresh thinking and collaborative and imaginative way we work. <laughs> we also look for opportunities to leverage our scale to our customers' advantage. Not to the public's advantage, obviously. Not to you and me. Not to our advantage, but to their customers, which, as they've already said, is local and national government and large corporations. Apparently, Serco is a values-led company. And their culture and ethos are at the heart of everything that they do. They give their people responsibility so they can put their ideas into practice and make a real difference. Their approach has made them one of the world's leading service companies and their vision is to be the world's greatest. Their service ethos means that their customers come back to them again and again as long-term relationships help them to meet their changing needs and do what they do best and bring service to life. I'm starting to sound like an advertisement again, but I wanted, I wanted to start this little section off about uh, Serco, which apparently does mean service company. Um, I wanted to start it off by giving you the official line, giving you the party line. So that's what it says there about us on their website, which is, of course, circogut.com. So you can go and see for yourself. So their markets then. Let's have a quick look at their markets because they seem, they're very, very proud of their markets. So at Circo, we design, deliver and manage change in markets as diverse as defense, transport, civil government, science and the private sector. Now, it's interesting that they uh, they separate the private sector from everything else because, as we know, everything is now in the private sector. The very fact that Serco are involved in our armed forces and our border patrols, uh, our border controls and our prisons, etc., means that everything is in the private sector. There is no public service left. And as somebody who was in the armed forces and has been at the mercy of this company, I can tell you that when you're looking for food and the only thing that's available is the Serco delivery, which is going to be coming via a chopper, but is being managed by Serco. And well, they've had a, they've had a supply issue of some kind. And well, you know, you just have to wait, don't you? You soon learn how to skin rabbits and how to skin pretty much anything. 
This diversity is one of their greatest strengths. As a business, it exposes us to more opportunities for growth. Well, that just means that they, uh, they then take a bigger step into controlling more and more and more of our public services. Oh, that's right, of course. I've already said, haven't I? We don't have any public, air quotes, services left. They improve per patient care in our health services. To, well, do they? They rehabilitate offenders in our prisons. They protect borders through technology. They provide swift, safe travel with our trains and transport systems. They help young people learn in the schools and training centers they manage. They enable trade by the precise measurements undertaken by scientists. And they bring service to life again. Once again, let's just look at the diversity, everything there. They've got the military, the uh, offenders system, the transport system, schools, hospitals, rehabilitation. They've got it all covered. And when you look down here at uh, some of the markets that are in the BPO, um, which is uh, Global Services, uh, businesses brings together all our BPO capabilities, enabling them to support our clients and visit Circle's Global BPO businesses. And uh, they do consulting, defense, education, environmental services, facilities management, health, home affairs, ICT, leisure, local government, nuclear, science, transport and welfare services. So I immediately want to pick out nuclear. <laughs> because Serco manages the UK Atomic Weapons Establishment. AWE as part of a consortium with Lockheed Martin and Jacobs. AWE is one of the most advanced research, design and production facilities in the world, developing, develop, developing these sophisticated materials, quantum physics and computer modelling vital to the safe and effective maintenance of the UK's nuclear deterrent. AWE experts also play a leading role in nuclear non-proliferation and international nuclear security. And yes, I know I stumbled over non-proliferation. So basically, ladies and gentlemen, the British nuclear deterrent and nuclear atomic weapons have been sold off into the hands of Serco. Because as one of Neil's guests managed to get in in the brief time that they were allowed to be on air, the four-minute warning that we all had to get used to back in the 1980s and that we were all made very well aware of, that was going to be provided and supported by Serco. Well, they've gone one step further since then, haven't they? They now actually manage and control the very weapons that we were supposed to be listening out for and defending against. I wonder which other countries they they manage the nuclear weapons for. I wonder which other governments and countries would be stupid enough, would be absolutely ignorantly, ridiculously stupid to hand over their nuclear weapons to a private company with this company's history. Absolutely unbelievable. So that's the nuclear elements, and they're very proud. They have a very happy, smiling engineer. And I'm sure that the man there himself, I'm sure he's a very good man, and I'm sure he does his job diligently and to the best of his ability and with the best intentions. But one shouldn't look at the individuals in these cases. You need to look at the companies. You need to look at the management. You need to look at the large picture. Okay, so defense then. You thought that defense was a government thing, didn't you? National defense was down to the government, you thought. Well, let me throw some examples of uh, how Serco is a leading provider of integrated service solutions in the worldwide defense and aerospace markets. You see, it's a market. 
They are a service solution provider in a marketplace. These people are the very people who make so much profit out of war, which is why we are in a state of perpetual war. Because without it, Serco wouldn't make profit. And without profit, there would be no Serco. And without any Serco, who would manage all these things? So this is what they have to say on their website. Defence Serco supports the armed forces of a number of countries around the world, including the United Kingdom, United States and Australia, working across the land, sea, air, nuclear and space environments. They're even in space. Now, why do you think they involve and include space in their defence package? Is that because the ultimate front line is in space? Whilst young men and women, the children of the poor, are running across ground and dying in the air and dying on the sea, the last front line will be in space and Serco will be there providing a service solution in a worldwide market. Let's continue with what they have to say about themselves. Our mission is to deliver affordable defence capability and support to the armed forces. We work in partnership with our customers in government and the private sector to address the cost of defence. So they have private defence customers. Wow. Delivering affordable change and assured operational support services. In the UK and Europe, Serco manages the UK Atomic Weapons Establishment, as we've already uh, mentioned, as a part of a consortium with Lockheed Martin and Jacobs. They enable the Royal Navy to move in and out of port at HM Naval bases Faslane, Portsmouth, and Davenport for operational deployment and training exercises. Ladies and gentlemen, we can't even get our ships and submarines out of the harbour without Serco. Just while we're on that, actually, um, the RAF is also in the pay, well, the Serco is, or is is in the pay of the RAF, but the RAF is dependent upon Serco. They project solutions, they are, uh, Serco project solutions have pr provided test systems to the RAF for 15 years. Europe's largest helicopter base at RNAS called Rose. It trains royals. Turns our wound, returns our wounded from wars abroad and even developed the Olympic flame, delivered the Olympic flame. Ethos looks at the many services Serco provides to RNAS Caldros. Training military aircrew for operational deployment. The medium support helicopter aircraft training facility at the UK Joint Helicopter Command State of the Art Synthetic Training Facility. We can't even train our own pilots anymore without Serco. We are completely in the hands of this company. They provide facilities in an, and information systems supported to the MOD's Defence Science and Technology Laboratory. The UK government's leading defence research establishment, including a £400 million programme to rationalise the DSTL estate. That means close. They're spending £400 million closing the vast majority of the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory estate. That's what rationalise means. It means close, demolish. We also provide facilities management services to the defence estates in support of the UK military presence in Gibraltar. 
Serco provides extensive engineering and maintenance support to UK military aviation, including the Fleet Air Arm, the Royal Air Force, working on over 16 military aircraft types. Gosh, do we have 16 different types of aircraft? So I'm amazed we've got 16 aircraft that can actually fly. Uh, in addition to the logistical, I, I kid you not, I tell you what, some days I, I was at flying bases and there was not a handful of aircraft that were actually airworthy. I have been at those places when that situation has been in place, when there is almost a handful of aircraft that can actually fly. You would be amazed at some of the stuff that goes on. Bead window, bead window. Serco provides extensive engineering and in addition to the logistical support services and RAF bases across the country, including Bryce Norton, that's the main airhead where everything goes in and out, Lynham and High Wycombe. What's at High Wycombe? I hear you ask. That's the headquarters of Air Command. Where a multinational multi-service command is in place. Our space and security specialists provide spacecraft operation and in-theater support to the Skynet 5 secure military satellite communications network. We maintain the UK's anti-ballistic missile warning system at RAF Filingdales. It's not all that goes on at Filingdales. And support the UK Air Surveillance and Control System. ASACS and Serco also supports the intelligence mission of the MOD and US Department of Defence at REF Menworth Hill. So Serco gets all the national intelligence of the US and the UK all in one place at Menworth Hill, fed in from several bases around the UK and overseas. Cyprus! <coughs> <coughs> oh dear, I've got <coughs> something separate caught in my throat. <coughs> Uh, CERCO enables the training of national security personnel through its services at the Defence Academy of the United Kingdom. The MOD's World Class Institute, well it's not the MOD's, is it? it's CERCO's, because they are the uh, trainers and controllers of the private military. Uh, the MOD's World Class Institute responsible for educating military leaders of tomorrow. Once again, all done with a common purpose. Uh, we train all the RAF's hel helicopter pilots in the advanced training facility at RAF Benson and we manage the cabinet officers emergency planning college the government's training center for crisis management and emergency planning in the UK we also developed an approach that combines the introduction of wind farm friendly radar technology at RRH Trimmingham, Snackstone Wold and Brisley Wood that has enabled 5GW wind farms wind farm development projects that are equally important to the Department of Energy and Climate Change to meet it. Oh, God. Oh, dear. Once again, something else that government should be not, should not be involved with. Uh, to meet its commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Welcome, blah, de, blah, de, blah. Uh, discover how we support armed forces in the United States and Australia. Well, we will in just a second, but I want to just quickly nip back and look at Skynet 5. Ooh. Safari can't verify the identity of the website, paradigmsecure.com. The certificate for this website is invalid. <gasps> well, I tell you what, I don't think I'll go there. Why would I not want to go to a website whose, whose certificate has ex is invalid? You might be connecting to a website that is pretending to be paradigmsecure.com 
which would put your confidential information at risk. Would you like to connect to the website anyway? No, I certainly would not. But you see, anybody else who didn't have their security settings as I do, and anybody else who would just go, Oh yeah, of course, I want to go and have a look at that, would be handing everything over to Serco. Everything. Access to your computer by simply clicking a link from Serco's very own. Now, they bear in mind, of course, that they manage the IT, IT systems of the UK military and they are dealing with highly sensitive and secure data at Menworth Hill. And. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> and and filing dales. Wow. Oh, and Bryce Norton, Lionel and High Wickham. But they have an invalid security certificate on their own website. On one of their own websites. So let's just click cancel there, shall we? Do you know what? I'm very dubious about clicking any links in this now. So I tell you what, let's leave this this pit of uh, of vile rot. Let's have a look at some of the truth, shall we? Let's have a look at Serco's checkered history. The CEO of Serco, a British-based company whose North American division received one of the largest contracts to work on the Obamacare insurance exchanges. <laughs> we all know how successful they've been. <laughs> Resigned uh, amid allegations that the company had defrauded the British government of millions of pounds, even as myriad other allegations emerged about its work around the globe. Serco spent heavily on lobbying in Washington, D.C., and secured a multi-year contract, potentially worth $1.249 billion, to handle paper applications for the Obamacare exchanges. <laughs> $1.249 billion. You can't feed your own people in the US. They are reliant on food stamps, which is no doubt managed by Serco. Gosh, I'd not even thought about that. Who manages the, f the food stamps program? Because it's all swipe cards, isn't it? I bet that's Serco. Anyway, we can find that out later. Somebody in the chat box will probably know. Uh, Serco did not respond to email and voicemail requests for comment. Public records demonstrate Serco's concentrated effort to woo the US government in recent years. It spent more than a million dollars on lobbying the political activists, including $6,450 donated to President Obama's election campaign. But Serco are a British company. I didn't think that country that companies and individuals from outside the US could actually deno uh, donate to a presidential campaign. Or have they changed the rules? Hmm. And uh, that's according to the Sunlight Foundation. Uh, as the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, was considering proposals for insurance exchange work, Serco spent $100,000 to hire Greenberg Trorig, former home of Jack Abramoff, a lobby regarding the implementation of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, according to January registration papers. Among the Greenberg Trurig lobbyists working on the Serco account was Mark Hayes, a former Senate health policy aide. During his time on the Capitol Hills, Hayes, quote, was instrumental in the key coverage, financing and delivery system reform provisions of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. According to his Greenberg Trurig bio and Quote, acted as lead Republican staff negotiator for the group of six healthcare reform negotiations. Less than a year after the ACA was signed, Hayes left Capitol Hill to become a lobbyist representing several health sector clients. Hayes became a central subject of a federal insider trading investigation. The Washington Post reported that Hayes had sent information about a significant Medicare policy change to an analyst at Height Securities. 
The analyst then sent out an alert to Heights hundreds of investor clients ahead of the administration's public announcement and trading in Humana Etna, the other healthcare stocks immediately soared. Hayes could not be reached for comment and it's unclear whether the investigation is continuing. Papers filed after the incident stated that Hayes was expected to cease lobbying for Serco. Regardless of the uh, recent federal scrutiny of Hayes, Serco's big spending seems to have paid off. Uh, in early July, the Obama administration awarded Serco a contract worth up to $1.249 billion to manage paper applications for the new insurance exchanges. The company will determine eligibility for tax credits, Medicaid, and exemptions from tax penalties. So, <laughs> your tax is in their hands and your eligibility is in the hands of Serco. Privacy concerns have already arisen because in 2011, a data breach in the U.S. Thrift Savings Plan for federal employees managed by Serco jeopardized the social security numbers and confidential information of more than 120,000 participants. Just weeks after the Obama administration announced Serco's contract award, news broke that Britain's serious fraud office had opened an investigation into the, cooper into the corporation, which had government contracts to electronically monitor criminals released from prison. An audit discovered that Serco and another company may have been overbilling the government by as much as $80.8 million dollars as many as one in six criminals whose uh da, 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 sorry i do apologize as one as many as in six criminals whose monitoring had been paid for by the british government were reportedly either dead back behind bars no longer under supervision own or no longer live in the uk <laughs> Oh dear, and the British government just paid out for prisoners who were dead, in prison, free or released, not free, because we're not free, or they, but released, and weren't even in the country. Furthermore, although US com companies that are part of a foreign company are obliged to report any billing uh, wrongdoings abroad, Serco did not give CMS such notice. Reuters reported that, uh, nevertheless, uh, Reuters reported that, uh, nevertheless, the Obama administration defended its decision to award the $1.249 billion contract to Serco, claiming it was a, quote, highly skilled company. Yes, highly skilled in doing what? That's right, fraud. With, quote, a proven track record of providing cost-effective services to numerous other federal agencies. <laughs> cost-effective, that's right, because they don't do what they're supposed to do, which makes them cost-effective. Uh, shortly after that, more red flags went up. In August, the London police opened an investigation into Serco after allegations that it had falsified documents for other government contract for transporting defendants from confinement to court. Serco had repeatedly delivered prisoners late, and after it received a warning last summer, evidence emerged of potentially fraudulent behaviour, according to the UK Secretary of State for Justice. Shortly thereafter, Serco said it had identified misreporting among its employees. Even so, in late September, well, of course, they have to blame the employees. It's not the company's fault. It's not the company's fault. It's these individuals who need retraining or sacking. It's not the company's fault. Just as long as you bear that in mind, they were not at fault. Uh, even so, in late September, the US amended Serco's CMS contract, adding $87 million in value. Though it's unclear what work they will that will entail or whether it will add to the $1.249 billion potential worth of the original con contract. As of writing, contract officers and media spokespeople from CMS had not responded to the, to the National Review's online requests for more details. 
Sunco's big role in the Obamacare exchanges is even more disturbing in the light of its record with the British National Health Service. Oh, what have they done to the British National Health Service apart from make it privatizable and uh, make it nice and cheap to be sold off? In 2006, Serco won a contract to provide out-of-hours physician service in Cornwall. The Guardian reporter, Felicity Lawrence, reported that the quality of service promptly declined. Well, I never a circo cut costs by cutting staff. Reportedly, there were sometimes more than 90 patients at a time waiting on the telephone helpline. And according to whistleblowers, circo on at least one occasion had only one general practitioner available overnight for the entire county. Furthermore, in 2010, Lawrence wrote a Cornish boy, Ethan Carrigan, six, died as a result of a burst appendix when the Serco out of our service advised putting him to bed rather than sending a general practitioner to examine him. So now they give out medical advice. Well, they give out certain advice to ensure that your child dies. So, it continues. The Care Quality Commission, which regulates British health services, soon found that Serco's managers routinely altered daily performance reports, which showed if the service was meeting its targets for responding to calls from patients on time. And in March 2013, the National Audit Office reported that within a six-month period, Serco had on 252 occasions made, quote, unauthorized changes to performance data. In other words, they lied, they cheated, and they defrauded us. That it offered to the NHS about its operations in Cornwall. That was just in Cornwall. 252 occasions of unauthorized changes to performance data just in Cornwall. And Cornwall isn't huge. Nor are the Cornwall derelictions Serco's only healthcare debacle. In 2009, the British government awarded a $1.29 billion contract outsourcing its biggest pathology lab to GSTS Pathology, a joint venture of Serco, King's College Hospital and Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital. In 2011, the pathology lab saw a whopping 400 clinical incidents. <laughs> what a lovely way to put a mistake. <laughs> These errors included blood and tissue samples being mislabeled or lost altogether. You ever wondered why you have to keep going back and having those blood tests done? That could be a reason why. Because Serco have messed up. Records requests by Corporate Watch, a not-for-profit organization, revealed that one patient got the wrong blood test results and another got inaccurate results for a kidney damage test. The Care Quality Commission reported in June 2012 that GSTS had failed to comply with regulations for staff training and supervision. Well, of no, of course, because that costs money, doesn't it, which eats into profits. And we can't have that. Recent news outside the healthcare sector has also called Serco's ethical standing into question. But they're a very ethical company. In Britain, a 23-year-old Romani woman claimed that at Yarlswood Immigration Detention Centre, which is run on contract by Serco, officers coerced women to engage with them sexually offering to make life easier, saying they would have more chance of winning their case or staying in the country if they acquiesced. Since then, three more women have made similar allegations about inappropriate sexual behaviour at Yarlswood. And three staffers at Yarlswood were dismissed after allegations of sexually inappropriate behaviour. 
Tsuko paid an undisclosed sum to a 29-year-old asylum seeker from Pakistan who claimed she was sexually assaulted by a nurse at Yarlswood, although the company did not admit liability. Well, well, they did because they paid out. So that's them admitting liability, isn't it really? Furthermore, in 2004, a 14-year-old boy, Adam Rickwood, committed suicide at a Circo-run youth facility, becoming the youngest person to die in British custom custody in modern times. At the inquest, the jury found that staff had inappropriately used a violent restraining method against Rickwood, who had already been saying he would commit suicide if forced to remain in the facility. Staffers had hit him on in the nose, giving him severe nosebleed that was untreated, the inquest found. Shortly afterwards, Rickwood hanged himself with a pair of shoelaces. So they murder kids as well. National Review spoke to Harriet Wisrich, a lawyer for several of y Yarlswood women. She said that though she has direct knowledge only of the detention centre operations of Serco, she thinks the American public has reason to question the $1.249 billion contract. Serco has got a lot of bag marks about it, Wisrich says, adding that it is far too large and that means that they can get away with scandals without it really affecting their stability to carry on bidding for things. Allegations have also emerged in Australia about significant problems in Circo Rum facilities. Last year in 2010, Training, a, a training manual was leaked online. It de detailed how employees could use physical force to control those held at immigration detention centres, including punches, baton strikes, kicks, and temporarily debilitating blows to pressure points. That's how people are killed. You don't use a you don't use any kind of blow to a pressure point because there is nothing temporary or debilitating, other than bringing on death. The Australian Minister for Immigration and Citizenship said that the manual, which had since been replaced, did, quote, not reflect very clear guidelines agreed to by Serco and the Department of Immigration on engagement with people in detention facilities. So that's them covering their own backs then. Uh, in 2011, I, an inspection by the Australian government found, quote, dangerous overcrowding, inadequate and ill-trained staff, no crisis planning, and no requirement that Serco add employees when population exceeded capacity. In the Serco room facilities, and in September 2013, Guardian reporters discovered that though Serco was contractually required to submit regular reports to the Australian government about several of its detention centres, it had failed to do so. And furthermore, the Australian government has found that since Serco took over facilities, instances of self-harm by immigrant detainees, including children, have increased significantly. The Obama administration must have known about Serco's checkered history, even if it was being lobbied to award the corporation an ACA insurance exchange contract. Any one of these scandals would have been troubling enough, but taken together, they make you wonder what the US government was thinking. As with so much of the rest of Obamacare. Uncle Phil Collins is not my uncle. He borrowed me dad's orbital sander once. Um, he didn't. Um, right. I want to uh, just keep us on the topic of uh, private companies that are so deeply ingrained into what are supposed to be public services um, by just relating a couple of stories that have been in the news recently and that are currently in the news. Now, uh, I've been speaking about Serco. And uh, they have their justice services, of course. And uh, back in December 2013, I reported on this um, very, very early on in it, uh, in it breaking. And uh, I was still reporting about it when a lot of people just hadn't heard about it, just knew nothing about it. And um, now I'm looking at this story 
And when you look at uh, just about every website at the moment has, you know, a Facebook button and a Twitter button and a LinkedIn button and a Google Plus button and a pinned it and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Well, this has had 22 clicks on Facebook. So I imagine that's 22 likes or 22 references on Facebook and one tweet from this page, which means that's how important people think this story is and that's how interested they are. So 22 people have bothered to click the Facebook button and one solitary soul has clicked the Twitter button. Well, it is International Business Times, but even so, this was written by Ewan Palmer, December 13th, 2013. And if you were listening to me back then, you will know that uh, I've reported on this and uh, I get quite vitriolic. But I think it's a... It's a... What we are going to see as typical of these private companies which are allowed to make money from the suffering of others. A woman who miscarried in Peterborough jail forced to clean up own blood and fetus. The headline says it all. And the write-up is very brief as well. This is how important they think that this story is. A woman who suffered a miscarriage was made to clean up her after herself while the fetus lay on the floor of her cell, a court has heard. Nadine Wright, 37, claimed that a nurse was present when she lost her baby at HMP pre Peterborough, but she was told that she had to clean up her own blood and the fetus. Well, it, look, look, let's get this right. When it says fetus, it means baby. It means human being. Okay? We need to differentiate from the fact that, oh, oh fetus is, is just something else. It's not real. It's not, that's, that's the, um, pro light, that's the, um, pro, uh, abortion people trying to disassociate it with anything which makes it human. Okay, you use the word fetus and that, that sort of stops it being human or something. The fact of the matter is, a human being died and this woman had to give birth to it after it had died. The allegations emerged during a sentencing hearing for breaching earlier court orders and admitting shoplifting. Wright said she had stolen food out of desperation as she could not afford it. You see, once again, we have this situation where bits of paper, data, data figures in computers mean that somebody can or cannot feed themselves. Her barrister, Philip Gibbs, told Leicester Crown Court, quote, there was blood everywhere and she was made to clean it up. The baby was not removed from the cell. It was quite appalling. It was very traumatic. She only received health care three days later after the governor intervened. So, a woman miscarries in her prison cell. She's made to clean up herself, the cell, and the dead baby. And she doesn't get any health care of any kind for three days. The alleged incident occurred one day after Wright was taken into custody. And why was, she, why was Nadine taken into custody? What heinous crime had she committed? What danger to society was she? Was she a threat to national security? Was she a threat to a politician? Was she a threat to our very fundamentalness of our society? It's so tongue-tied. Gibbs told the court that Wright was convicted of stealing 13 pounds and 94 pence worth of food after she did not receive her welfare benefits. 
She'd suffered mental health issues and had battled heroin addiction since her teens, he added. 13 pounds and 94 pence. That's how much you're worth. That's how much the life of a baby is worth. That's how much the life of a human being is worth in this society. Our so-called... Our so-called civilized society makes me sick. She steals 13 pounds worth of 94 pence of food so that she can have something to eat because the state hadn't paid her welfare. But hey, Wright pleaded guilty to breaching two community orders and was jailed for 10 months. And the day after, her baby died in its cell. And then she was made to clean up herself, the cell, and the dead human that was at her feet on the cold concrete floor of that cell, which is run by a private company. The authorities at the prison said, the private prison said they did not comment on individual cases but confirmed that a prisoner had received medical treatment on the day of her arrival in prison and was seen by a GP the following day. Well, they quite clearly lied. A spokesperson added, we have a duty of care to all prisoners. As part of that, we ensure that all prisoners have access to the same level of NHS services as those in the community. You are worthless to them, alive. The only time you're worth anything is when you are a criminal for stealing 13 pounds and 94 pence worth of food. Or you are dead or dying in one of their so-called health service hospitals. Talking of which, charge patients £10 a month for using the NHS, a study suggests. People should be charged a £10 monthly membership fee for using the NHS alongside hotel-style charges. <laughs> hotel-style charges for hospital stays. <laughs> oh my God. The study, which is co-authored by the former Labour Health Minister, Lord Warner. Oh, well done. Well done for sticking to your socialist caring principles, Lord Warner. Who will never, ever, ever have to use an NHS hospital. Oh, dear Lord, no. He'll have the private one, thank you. He called for registered uh, radical changes on how the NHS is funded. Oh, hold on. Don't we all pay national insurance for funding the NHS? Under the proposals published by the centre-right think tank Reform, every resident would gain NHS membership at a monthly fee of £10. Oh, so you can have NHS membership. Ooh. Do you get a party bag? A little bag and a little badge. A little bag, a little badge, maybe a poster of your favourite doctor. <gasps> a bag, a badge, a poster of your favourite doctor. Those receiving free prescriptions would be exempt from the charges, the report added. Oh, that's nice. Because, hey, if you can't afford the seven or eight pounds that the prescription charge is, then, hey, well, how are you going to afford the £10? It argued that NHS funding from general taxation should only rise with inflation to avoid starving the rest of the public sector of resources. Oh, well, of course. We can't let other public sector areas be starved of resources because people get ill. Dear God, no. I do apologise, Rikanani. Deary me now. 
patient should also contribute co-payments for the hotel costs of some inpatient hospital care, the report said. By the end of the next Parliament, it is possible to envisage these changes in entitlements yielding £6 billion a year. Because, hey, they've just got to get more money out of you. Lord Warner said, quote, We can no longer pay homage to an out-of-date and unaffordable NHS that's unfit for today's and tomorrow's care needs. A Department of Health spokesman said, quote, The founding principles of the NHS make it universally free at point of use, and we are clear that it will continue to be so. Almost. <laughs> Can I tell you that if you have a road accident in this country and uh, an ambulance comes and picks you up and takes you to the emergency room and then you, you stay in hospital, you know what you receive shortly afterwards? A bill. Because under the Road Traffic Act, you are liable for the cost of your recovery and care. I say care and I use that term very loosely. But yes, if you are uh, uh, injured in a road accident and uh, you have the misfortune to be put in the back of an ambulance and taken to one of these slaughterhouses, I, I mean hospitals, um, you will be charged for the privilege. You will receive a bill to your home address, which you will, of course, be expected to pay promptly and duly and with great, great, great humbleness. Almost half of the politicians who don't have to use the NHS because they can afford private care believe the NHS may no longer remain free at the point of need if the cha challenges it faces are not tackled, a poll has found. I wonder who did this poll and I wonder who they polled because nobody came and asked me. Health leaders have previously warned that the NHS will only survive if there are radical changes in the delivery of health care. The poll of 100 MPs, oh, there we go, conducted by the NHS Confederation, <laughs> there we go, found 48% agreed that a free NHS would be unsustainable if some of its problems were not tackled. Well, why don't you, why don't you 48%, why don't you 48 take a cut in your, in your uh, millionaire building status and hand some of that over so that the less fortunate can have some health care. You vile pigs. All 650 of you. You vile, evil pigs. That is the most I'm going to allow myself to say about this topic on this radio station. I have other radio outlets for less appropriate language. They make me sick. Genuinely, genuinely make me sick. This is why I'm a libertarian. This is why I say, small government, leave me alone, and I'll leave you alone. Believe what you want to believe, and I will believe what I want to believe, and you leave me alone, and I'll leave you alone. Stay out of my way, and I'll stay out of yours. Get in my way, and you'll go down and you won't get up again. I promise you. And when the jack-booted Stasi come banging on my door in the, in the wee small hours of the night, I'm ready for them. Absolutely, 100% ready for them. Because remember, I used to be one of them. I know how they work. I know what they do. I know their tactics. I know them inside out. Bead window, bead window. Come for me. And many of you won't be leaving the way you arrived. That's all I'm going to say about that. Let's move on to a different topic. I think it's possibly best. Because we here in the UK have the pleasure of being part of the European Union. Now, <laughs> the other day, I upset quite a few listeners, and I am still apolog apologising for playing some backmasking. 
and uh, play some examples of bite masking to show how vile and evil it is, but yet um, I upset quite a few people. And I'm probably going to, uh, this is probably going to have the same effect. Uh, the EU and Brussels. <laughs> you see, because there are many things about the European fascist state that uh, lots of people don't know. And I'm talking to the left-wingers who say that we have to be in Europe to, um, to gain from it, to gain so much from it in health and safety regulations and... Uh, I was going to say financial security, but we know that's a load of tosh, don't we? Um, but what are the Nazi roots of the Brussels EU? So let's have a look at what you always wanted to know about the Brussels EU, but no one dared to tell you. Now, this is taken from a book called Relay of Life. And it's a book that you can read online. You can buy it if you want. You can buy a hard copy or you can read it PDF style or online for free. And I want to take some, uh, I want to take some portions of this over the next, uh, over the next, uh, segment and, uh, go into it, talk about it, read some of it to you, break it down, and then, uh, we shall destroy the EU together because whether you consider yourself on the left, on the right, we know that politically there is no left and right in reality. We know that it is run by the same puppet master. It's a Punch and Judy show. Mr. Punch on the right, his, his partner, his wife, Judy on the left. The puppeteer has his hand up both of them. And that's how it is with politics today. Whether you're left, right, center, far right, far left, it matters not. But the book, The Relay of Life, uh, tells the story that many readers may, for obvious reasons, initially reject. In doing so, they may say that if the far-reaching historical information documented were true, they would surely have heard about it before. I hope you have, and I know that the, that the vast majority of people listening to this broadcast or podcast at some point in the future or routinely listen to Awake Radio will know a lot of truth that the average doesn't get. Mindful of this, the authors consider it their responsibility to encourage their readers not only to read this book, but also to visit and study the source documents noted in the book. There's something I always say to you as well. Don't believe a word I say, but take the information and go and find out for yourself and go and make up your own mind. But take the, a nug, even if it's just a tiny nugget of information I give you, Take it, go with it, research it, and you'll find that, unfortunately, I'm right. For almost three quarters of a century, the world has been told that World War II was caused by a psychopath, Adolf Hitler, and his entourage of racist hooligans, the Nazis. The facts are, however, that World War II was a conquest war conducted on behalf of the chemical, oil and drug cartel with the goal of controlling the multi-trillion dollar global markets in the newly emerging fields of patented chemical products. Official documents from the US Congress and the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunals unequivocally show that World War II was not only prepared, but also logistically and technically facilitated by the largest and most notorious oil and drug cartel at that time, namely the German IG Farben cartel composed of Bayer, BASF, Hoist and other chemical companies. The summary of the indictment from Nuremberg proves that without IG Farben, World War II could not have taken place. We also learn in, the, in this book, Relay of Life, that World War I, the second largest tragedy of the 20th century, was actually the first attempt at world conquest by these corporate interests. Moreover, 
After both these military attempts to subjugate Europe and the world had failed, the oil and drug cartel invested in a third attempt, the economic and political conquest of Europe by means of the Brussels EU. Not surprisingly, therefore, the key architects for the Brussels EU were recruited from among those technocrats who had already designed the plans for a post-World War II Europe under the control of the Nazi cartel coalition. This book, The Relay of Life, will introduce you to these stakeholders of the cartel, dressed not in military uniforms, but in grey suits, and the most notorious of whom was Walter Holstein, the first president of the so-called EU Commission. The answer to the question as to why you have probably not heard from these ground-shaking facts before is straightforward. After 1945, the cartel invested hundreds of billions of dollars with one goal only, to rewrite history and cover its criminal past. This cover-up with regard to the corporate origins of two world wars was obviously the precondition for the cartel's third attempt, this time via the Brussels EU, at the conquest and control of Europe. Evidently, the cartel interests had hoped to cement their control over Europe via the Brussels EU, without these dark roots ever being exposed. However, this plan has failed. The publication of this book and the tens of thousands of authentic documents it references mean that the Brussels EU experiment is over. No democratic person, organization or party can possibly now support this third attempt at the conquest of Europe. The Relay of Life is also a unique opportunity for all those politicians and political parties who've been lured into supporting the Brussels EU without knowing its background or understand its true purpose. This includes the 27 heads of state who've signed the Lisbon Treaty, the majority of whom did not understand that their signatures constituted an enabling act for the cartel and its stakeholders to seize control over Europe. These politicians and political parties now have the chance to make a complete turnaround and to publicly revoke their support for a model of Europe that has been built upon decades of lies and deception. We therefore encourage you to help disseminate this important information among your family, friends, work colleagues and in your community. Moreover, we encourage you to confront your political representatives at the local, regional, national and European level with the information contained in the book. In doing so, you must urge these politicians to make a choice. Either they can close their eyes to the truth and thereby recklessly support the takeover of Europe by dictatorship of corporate interests, or they can act to protect democracy and the health of life interests of millions of people. The choice these politicians make with regard to their position on the Brussels EU will be the most important decision of their political careers. After the last attempt of the cartel to control Europe had failed in 1945, one of the most wide, widely used excuses by its political stakeholders was that they didn't know. After the publication of this book, however, no politician today can make such a claim in defense of his or her continued support for the Brussels EU. From the historic perspective, what is most urgently needed now is a movement of the people. This is a particularly important because politicians in many countries across Europe have become influenced by the corporate interests of the oil and drug cartel. Thus, they are no longer independent defenders of the interests of the people. A movement of the people will therefore be the only guarantor of freedom, democracy and independence for the people of both Britain and Europe. Now, such a movement did get going, didn't it? And it was called UKIP. But they have been vilified and infiltrated to such an extent that they are so right-wing that um, Hitler won't be disappointed of them would be uh, disappointed not to be a member. However, how does democracy turn into a dictatorship? 
The Brussels EU is portraying itself to the world as a shiny example of the 21st century democracy. In reality, however, nothing could be further from the truth. In a true democracy, all power resides with the people. The principle of separation of powers between the three levels of government, executive, legislative and judicial, establishes checks and balances to protect against abuse. This principle is being universally accepted after mankind fought for it for thousands of years. So, what you have is the people who vote for the executive, president, government and the legislative, parliament. Those are the checks and balances. However, in contrast, the Brussels EU lacks, its fundament lacks this fundamental principle of separation of powers. Moreover, the people of Europe have neither control over the executive level nor over the legislative process. Worse, the parliament they elect has no means of effectively controlling these branches either. To hide this impotence, Article 225, the so-called Fig Leaf Article, was inserted into the Lisbon Treaty. This clause offers a possibility for the EU Parliament to request the Commission to submit a proposal for legislation. The Commission, of course, can simply refuse to do so. Operating outside the basic principles of democracy, the Brussels EU, by definition, is a dictatorship. The power of the people to determine their government has been transferred to corporate interests. This is why, you see, they do things like Lisbon Treaty, Ireland gets a vote. The people vote against it, so they make them vote again. People vote against it, so they make them vote again. Until eventually, they vote yes. And it all goes ahead. That's not democracy. You don't just keep voting until you get the response that you want. You accept the vote of the majority. One person, one vote. Yes or no. Not loads of no's and oh, we'll, we'll just do it again. Let's just do it again until such time as they vote the way we want them to. So, how the oil and drug cartel attempts to control Europe. The Brussels EU portrays itself to the world as a parliamentary democracy with the EU Parliament playing the decisive role. However, the executive decisions and drafting of all legislation is carried out by the EU Commission and its staff of over 54,000 people. From their offices in the Commission headquarters, the Bailamont building and other locations, this paid army of career bureaucrats craft the laws of Europe on behalf of corporate interests. In contrast, the 754-member EU Parliament is composed of politicians from 27 nations who have no controlling power over the army of bureaucrats. The EU Parliament functions as little more than a window dressing for the purpose of portraying the Brussels EU as a parliamentary democracy to the people of Europe. So, let's get this straight. All the laws, all the policies, everything is put in place, is decided upon and put in place by the EU Commission and its 54,000 employees. The 754 member EU Parliament has no control whatsoever over the bureaucrats. That right there tells you everything you need to know about the EU dictatorship. So, the oil and drug cartels instruct the EU Commission. The EU Commission instructs the EU bureaucracy. The EU bureaucracy, which is over 42,000 unelected bureaucrats and other staff employed directly by the EU Commission and over 12,000, quote, off the balance sheet staff. 
I wonder what off the balance sheet staff means. A total of over 54,000 people rules over all 500 million people in Europe. And what do we get to do? We get to vote for 754 members of the EU Parliament. But these elected members of the EU Parliament have no right for independent lawmaking. They are but window dressing. So when Farage and his crew are shouting about how they're going to bring down Europe from within, or get Britain out of Europe, Britain can't leave the EU unless all the other members of the EU vote and agree to let it go. You can't just walk away from the EU. Because what happens if you try to walk away? Well, you get blue helmets on your streets. And I don't mean the nice bobbies. They will seem like pussycats compared to the UN troops with their blue helmets that would be on the streets of Britain if it ever tried to leave the EU dictatorship. The stakeholders of the oil and drug cartel, well, I never. You're going to hear some very familiar names if you were I, a listener to Awake Radio. Here we go, then. So, previously, we emphasised the fact that the power determining the government of Europe has shifted from the people to the corporate interests, namely the oil and drug cartels. This cartel is well characterised. It comprises the multi-trillion dollar chemical, petrochemical and pharmaceutical investment interests. This cartel is by far the largest corporate investment group in the world. During the 20th century, this cartel has become not only the dominant economic force, but also has positioned its political stakeholders in the governments of the leading industrial nations of the world. Leading representatives from the financial circles controlling this cartel are top of the list, always top of the damned list, the Rockefeller Group. Representing the US-based oil and drug interests, this is the largest, largest and most uh, of these... I'd say I'm getting tongue-tied because that is just so... <sighs> Representing the US-based oil and drug interests, this is the largest of these financial interest groups. <laughs> I think I think fine entrail is probably about right, actually, for the Rockefeller Group. Built from the 19th century monopoly of the Standard Oil Corporation, it now controls dozens of chemical, pharmaceutical and oil multinationals around the globe. One of its most prominent ambassadors in recent decades has been Henry Kissinger. There's that name again. Germany and France, the leading export nations of chemical and pharmaceutical products in Europe. This group had its roots in the late 19th century and comprised Bayer, BASF, Hoist and later their infamous IG Farben cartel. Their modern day successor companies are the leading investment businesses in Europe today and have been instrumental in building up the Brussels EU. It was widely covered in the media at the time, just days before his appointment. Current EU President Rompuy was invited for his presidential job interview by the Bilderberg Group. An elite circle of US-European corporate interests under the control of David Rockefeller and chaired by the ex-EU Commissioner and drug lobbyist Ayrton de Voynen. So... Angela Merkel then, Germany, the world's leading exporter of chemicals, one of the leading drug exporters. Nicolas Sarkozy of France, this is at the time of writing, bear in mind, that uh, one of the leading drug exporters and one of the world's leading oil traders. And that vile, evil, leather-faced pig that is David Rockefeller. And I would say it to his face, given the chance. 
So the Rockefeller Group is the world's largest investment group. Its core investments in chemicals, oil and drugs. The Bilderberg Group, financial and political stakeholders of those chemical, oil and drug cartels, including Henry Kissinger, former secretary of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, Erton Devoinen, former EU commissioner and board member of the drug maker Gilead. November 19th, 2009, EU President Rompuy poses for the cameras with one of the men who brought him to power, Nicolas Sarkozy. The people of Europe had no vote and no say. None whatsoever. Totally unelected, yet in control of the dictatorship. So, ending democracy and returning to medieval times... For the disbelieving reader, it may be helpful at this point to summarise the selection process of the first president and foreign minister of the Brussels EU. The people of Europe were excluded from the decision making. The new royals of Europe were selected by an elite circle of corporate interests. The selection ceremony took place in a lavish aristocratic setting in the palace at the Valley of the Duchess on the outskirts of Brussels. French President Sarkozy Nicholas Paul Stephanie, Stefan Sarkozy, Di Nagy Boxer. Gosh, that's a name and a half, isn't it? No wonder he just calls himself Nicholas Sarkozy. But of course, that hides the Stefan Di Nagy Boxer. I hope I've said that right. The offspring of the petit aristocrat was the master of ceremonies. The Queen's crown was bestowed upon Baroness Catherine Ashton. The King's crown went to another person whose name reflects aristocratic descent, Herman von Rompuy. Von Rompuy will act as an interim monarch until such time as, possibly triggered by an international crisis, the petite aristocrat himself assumes the throne. In fact, the EU system of governments reverses all democratic achievements of European civilization over the past thousand years and throws the entire continent back to medieval times when aristocratic monarchs ruled Europe outside of any democratic control. And you think today that you are living in a democracy. I'm afraid you have no idea and you're not anywhere near. So did the people of Europe give up centuries of democracy voluntarily? Well, from the oil and drug cartel, the Brussels EU is merely an operative base from where it intends to conquer the world using political, economic and, if necessary, military force. Because don't forget they are combining all of the Europe military forces together into one controlling force. Towards this end, the cartel is currently trying to export the undemocratic construction of the Brussels EU to other regions of the world. The African Union is already being modelled after the Brussels EU, including an AU commission. The political stakeholders of the cartel are deceptively parading the Brussels EU as a modern, as a model of 21st century democracy and peace. From the sheer scope of this global PR campaign, the people of the world may have the impression that the Brussels EU was approved in a democratic election by the people of Europe and that this political body reflects their will. But nothing could be further from the truth. And there'll be more in just a couple of minutes. Bad Company by Five Finger Death Punch. The Bad Company song written by... Uh, written by bad company uh right let's get back to the eu then because uh, this is vital info i'm passing on here and i love passing on vital info and the thing is it can all be backed up with their own documents that's the joy of it you're just using their own bile their own vile vomit against them and I love it when I can use their own vomit against them. So, the actual facts cast a characteristic light of the fundamentally undemocratic nature of the Brussels EU. 
a warning sign to the world. Wherever you are in the world, listening to the sound of my voice. First of all, if you can hear the sound of my voice, then you are the resistance. Stuff you, Alex Jones, I can say it as well. I can bring peace and truth to the world. I'm doing it by talking to you. I'm giving you the info, the tools to go and fight the good fight. Whether that be for the deity of your choice, or your belief, or for the peace and freedom of your society. So let's have a look then. The only country where the people were allowed to vote on the Lisbon Treaty, the Enabling Act for the Brussels EU, was Ireland, whose population constitutes less than 1% of the total of Europe. And even this vote was the result of a mockery of democracy. In June 2008, the people of Ireland had rejected the Brussels EU construct in a resounding no. But the political stakeholders of the cartel in Brussels decided to ignore this vote. They bribed the Irish government into holding a second referendum and coerced a yes vote with a staggering amount of money challenged, sorry, channeled from the stakeholders of the cartel to Dublin. And what did that prompt? Was it massive house construction? Massive home building? And everybody had loads of money and then... <gasps> The money stopped flowing in, didn't it? And what happened? The economy went into the toilet. Over 99% of the population of Europe, numbering more than 500 million people, were denied the democratic right to vote on the Lisbon Treaty in a referendum. So the stakeholders of the cartel deprived the people of their democratic rights. This violation of all principles of democracy by the cartel is no coincidence. Opinion polls conducted across Europe showed a, re a rejection of the Brussels EU. By a vast majority of voters, the deceptive nature of the Brussels EU is best categorised by the fact that whilst it is hailed by the cartel stakeholders as a hallmark of democracy, the most basic democratic rights are denied in fear of the people. So, what are the strategic goals of the cartel? I'm going to uh, read you this bit, and then we'll have a little chat about it. I will vent some anger, and then we'll have a look at some of the headlines across the real media. I will be continuing this book, though, in future shows. I'm not going to make it, I'm not going to let it dominate the shows, but I will be making reference and reading from it in future shows. So the strategic goals of the cartel. On the previous pages, uh, they summarise what the plans of the oil and drug cartel are for constructing the Brussels EU. Obviously, this bold manoeuvre is not a random exercise, but has profound economic motives. So here, they explain why behind the Brussels EU. The financial groups behind the oil and drug cartel are interested in controlling giant global markets that affect literally every human life. Prominent examples of this are the areas of food, health and energy. Over the past century, the oil and drug cartel has expanded its markets in these three areas into multi-trillion dollar investment businesses. The construction of these giant global markets was based on two strategic tools. Firstly, the use of patents as tools for monopolizing markets. Secondly, public disinformation with the goal of keeping the public illiterate about the alternatives. As a result, every person in the industrialized regions of the world today pays around one third of their disposable income as tributes to this cartel. With the beginning of the 21st century, the cartel faces a fundamentally new challenge. All of its key markets, oil, drugs, agricultural chemicals and GMOs, are being threatened by new technologies that will ultimately replace the ex existing monopolistic and patent-based global markets. 
In this situation, the financial interests behind the cartel know that their multi-trillion dollar businesses can no longer survive in a, in a democracy. Thus, the undemocratic construct of the Brussels EU is a strategic step towards the setting up of a global dictatorship on behalf of these corporate interests. I've said it before and I'll say it again, they always, always play the long game. At the beginning of the 21st century, mankind stands at a crossroad. We have to decide whether we want to allow the oil and drug cartel interest to continue their domination over our lives by the imposition of largely antiquated technologies, or whether we are ready to liberate ourselves from that yoke by taking advantage of new, independent and sustainable technologies, such as renewable energies, science-based natural health and organic agriculture. And every day on this network and on the other network affiliates, you hear truth about renewable energy, science-based natural health and organic agriculture. And how many people are listening every day? How many people take the time to listen to those truths every day? Why is it that Neil Foster is intercepted and interrupted by GCHQ every single time he comes online? Do you know why? Because he's speaking the truth. The only way to protect ourselves is to stay out in the public. Stay in the public eye. Keep talking. Keep writing articles. Keep presenting stuff. Keep ourselves in the public eye. It makes us harder to get rid of. If we decide, oh, enough's in, I can't take this anymore. I can't take handling this truth anymore. It's so depressing. You know, when you say that, and they've won because you back out you become invisible and what happens then like well, you have an accident or you get really really ill and you disappear and you become not even a statistic the global multi-billion dollar markets of the chemical petrochemical and drug cartel Let's just summarize that the strategic goals of the cartel are to turn the lives and bodies of billions of inhabitants of our planet into a marketplace for their patented products. I'm a victim of that. I've spoken to you many times about the pharmaceuticals that I have been taking for years and that I have become dependent on, not addicted to, but dependent on for now. But I'm finding alternative ways of getting away from them. And carrying over their multi-trillion dollar benefits from previous century technologies, including environmentally damaging petrochemicals, toxic pharmaceuticals into the 21st century. We can argue all day, and that's what they want actually about how environmentally damaging petrochemicals are. That's what they want. Get distracted by something like, ooh, global warming, or ooh, global cooling, or ooh, climate change. Argue about that. Argue about the estrogen mimicking properties of soya. Argue about God, does he exist? Argue about money, does that exist? Argue about law, common law, statute law. Get hung up on all that stuff. Get hung up on, I don't know, gay marriage. Focus all your energies into the left wing of politics 
or the right wing of politics? Should people have guns or should they not? Racism, sexism, ageism, abortion rights or wrongs, incarceration limits, death penalties. Get hung up on all that rather than the actual fact that you are just a pawn for these people to make money off. You are simply a revenue stream. In the Matrix, you're a battery. That's all they see you as. You are a useful tool. You are a commodity. But I say no, you are more than that. You are a real, sovereign human being with thoughts, emotions and a powerful, powerful voice which directed properly can do so much good. You could bring absolute peace to this world. You could bring absolute end to hunger, starvation, poverty, abuse, violence, crime could all be ended. Everybody could live in the way that they want, in peace with everybody else. But it takes everybody. It takes the 6.9 billion of us to all stand up and say to that tiny, tiny minority, to say to David Rockefeller, no, no more. I will not allow you to do this to me or to anybody else. I will not allow this dictatorship to happen. I say no. But everybody has to say no because one can be squashed like a bug. But all of us together cannot be stopped. We are far too powerful and they know that and they're scared. I'm going to continue with more from The Relay of Life, the book about the real Brussels EU going to be continuing that in future shows but for now just in the last 10 minutes of the show I want to go through some of the headlines of the real media the real press well, let's start with my favorite and yours I hope <laughs> the community press group the latest articles I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. How very appropriate for what I've just been talking about and the way I've just been talking about it. Let's click on that article and just have a quick look at that. This is by Kerry Cork of CPG Glamorgan. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. I know that a lot of the news headlines that we are, that we read are put out there to judge our reactions, to pit us against one another or just pure propaganda pieces. My family tell me time and time again to stop watching or reading if it gets me so mad. But to me, it's imperative that the lies are exposed. I think most people reading this would already know that the Western media is lying to us about Turkey's reasons for blocking Twitter and YouTube. The BBC would have us believe that the leaked com conversation between Turkish Foreign Minister Ahmet Devetnew and Intelligence Chief Hakad Fidan spoke of possible military intervention in Syria. It's sad that it takes the alternative media or even Russia today to tell the people of the so-called Free West what the truth is. Turkish officials were plotting to attack their own sovereign territory to blame it on Syria as a false pretext to, a, to war, a false flag attack. Well, they've had good teachers, haven't they? The British, the Americans, the Germans, the French, they've all done it before. It's not a new tactic. 
uh, Roger Waters. I'm used to death. I'm not a person that gets wrapped up in the whole celebrity thing, but every now and again, some of those celebrities have a positive message to give. Roger Waters of Pink Floyd fame is one such celebrity. <laughs> I watched this article being uh, written, this next one. Mark my words, it doesn't take MI5 to see through windows. That is an article you have to go and read. Communitypressgroup.com So that's a quick look at the headlines there. Moving on to 21st Century Wire at uh, 2350 here in the UK. That's 1550 Pacific and 1850 Paula time. Oh, sorry, sorry, East Coast. I do apologize. I've renamed my clock Paula. Um, okay, so... Without doubt, our media war propaganda and the film you almost didn't see. That's called uh, an, item, an item there called Beyond a Doubt. Let's have a quick look at that one then because it is the top trending article on 21st Century Wire. The Western mainstream media's role in promoting any war or conflict can never be underestimated. This history has demonstrated time and time again their willingness to blindly promote the international corporate and shadow government's foreign policy objectives, which always results in the death of countless innocents, must stop. This is the story about a film which none of us were supposed to see. Not because the film wasn't up to professional journalistic standards, or that it was of poor quality. It was neither of those. Against the odds, and the establishment-owned international media syndicate, award-winning filmmaker and journalist John Pilger uh, reveals one of the most damning indictments of the American and British mainstream media. The content of this timeless film is stunning and shows beyond our reasonable doubt that our media are not only complicit in advancing conflict around the globe, but are actively engaged in pushing it on behalf of those who seek to profit from the international conflagrations. 21stCenturyWire.com to read more on that article. The FBI knew the Boston bombing suspects long before the main event. Uh, the FBI have still managed to dodge any serious questions or address the facts of the Boston case. That's uh, written today, 21st Century Wire. American education, is it a school or is it a prison? Now, I've heard it described as a prison. And um, I discussed this with uh, the co-host on uh, another show that I do and uh, not here on this network but on another network and uh, we had quite a heated discussion because it was seen as extremist and a little bit alarmist but do you know what whilst i haven't ever gone through the american education system from what i know about it from people who have it is very much like prison hmm so Episode 27, Sunday Wire, Zombie Aeroplanes, the MH370 and 9-11 with guests Field McConnell and Basil Valentine. Explosive new material on flight MH370 and its astounding 9-11 connection. More on that on the 21st Century Wire and hopefully in the very, 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 very near future with Neil Foster too. Head over to Sovereign Independent UK. Uh, what do the Nazi-rooted, oily Bilderberg syndicate Greenpeace have, and Greenpeace, have in common? Well, I've started telling you about uh, the EU and the Nazis, but uh, what do they have in common with the Greens? So... Founded in 1954, Bilderberg is an annual conference designed to foster dialogue between Europe and North America. And they've got a, they've got a picture there of Hitler and uh, the Nazi symbol, the swastika with the stars of Europe around it. And the picture there is, I have a dream. Bilderberg, Mr. Expenses, Ed Balls, Labour, the working class can kiss my arse. I've got the foreman's job at last. Every year, between 120 and 150 political leaders and experts from industry, finance, academia and the media are invited to take part in the conference. About two-thirds of the participants come from Europe and the rest from North America. One-third from politics and government and the rest from other fields. 
UK Secretary, not all rape is equal. He seeks to halve sentences, says rape is ver rapes vary anonymously. That's Ken Clark, who I had the misfortune of putting a camera up to, to be interviewed. And then that vile leather-faced pig, Rockefeller. Some even believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I'm proud of it. David Rockefeller. La Familia Rockefeller. And there, um, owner of Exxon and financer of Greenpeace. I believe that's written in, is that Spanish? That's why I can't read it properly. And there's a picture there on uh, Sovereign Independent UK. And uh, in that article, what do the Nazi-rooted oily Bilderberg syndicate and Greenpeace have in common? And there it is again, David Rockefeller. Now, you tell me that that man is not at the top of things. The astonishing chutzpah of King Bibi. Mass murder, ethnic cleansing. Deluded Ed Davey and mad old bishop speak on the climate. Sir Robin Malarkey, CBE, PIE, retired BBC climate expert. <laughs> BBC, CNN, Fox, mind-bending war whores, prostitutes. 2014 UK police thug to photographer, you're lucky I didn't knock you out, to be fair. <laughs> John Ball, clearly the constable in the video, uh, included in this article, in a highly stressed state of mind. See, when I joined the police force back in the very early 90s, um, I joined with very altruistic intentions to help my community do something positive. And I soon learned that that was not the way forward in the police. And unfortunately, I fell into the mould. And it seems that uh, John Ball has clearly fallen into that mode as well. Because anybody that says you're lucky, I, I didn't knock you out, to be fair has is really disappointed that they didn't get to knock out a photographer with two minutes to go i'm going to let uh, paula and steve know that uh, i'll be bringing the show to a close very very shortly and i will be finishing with a piece of music and uh, this particular piece of music is from a very favorite band of mine and it's Three, sec three minutes and 23 seconds long. But for now, I'm going to say thank you. Take care. Stay safe. I'll be back on Monday after Reality Bites with Neil Foster. And we'll see if we can get the, uh, the average airtime up for Neil. See if we can get it up above 25 minutes. But for now, take care. Big thank you to Awake, Shaziz. Shake and Wake, and 1800 Online for carrying this show and the others that go along before it and after. Take care.